Hello everybody, my name is Portia Aubrey and this is my book Short Stories. And this chapter is Patron Saint of Nothing short story. So um, pretty much, this is a short story I wrote for my English class. It's about the book, book Patron Saints of Nothing by Randy Rabay, and I highly recommend that you read it. Though I changed up the storyline a lot, it still has the same characters and atmosphere. And I hope you all enjoy. The wind blows through my hair, allowing it to fly majestically in the wind. The salty scent of the sea finds its way into my nostrils, though I have nothing against it. My shoulders hang limp by my side as I take a deep breath, relaxing as I wait for my cousins to arrive. The taste of this morning's coffee still lingers on my tongue, going to war with the eggs and bacon I had along with it. The waves of the beach rise and fall, rolling over my feet as the warm water calms my nerves for all the adventures that may occur today. The hustling sound of people running breaks me back into reality, and soon the cheerful voices of my cousins take over. June wraps me in a large hug, lifting me up, lifting me a few inches off of the ground. I let out a yelp, and he laughs joyfully as he lowers me back down. His goatee seems to have grown a bit since the last time I saw him. He looks healthier, too. I guess that rehabilitation has been going well for him. That's good. I can't imagine how big, bad things would have been if I had lost him. And to drugs, nonetheless. It probably would have been worse, even worse. We all probably would have lost him to coughs or vigilantes. The thought of it all makes my blood boil. Good morning, Jay. They all say in perfect unison as Angel and Grace also give me a quick hug. I let out a nervous chuckle. My body starts to heat up a bit under the early morning sun. Good morning, June, Angel, and Grace. Are you excited for today? Angel asks with a, youth, with a youthful and enthusiastic stance. Her smile is beaming and hopeful. I try to match her en energy, though I fail terribly. You bet I am. Then let's get going already. Tito Manning speaks up. His intimidating voice rises out of nowhere behind us. I swallow my fear and nod, trying to not show exactly how scared of him I really am. We better not be late. All four of us go silent and cold as we follow him and the other adults off of the beach. Tito Manning pl planned the entire day, sadly. So we end up ha having to go to the museum and listen to him lecture us about our history and how amazing the Turks is. I swear, he's like a puppy for that horrible, inhumane man. He does exactly what he's told and doesn't bother to question his master's orders. My parents wave me goodbye as we walk past the beach house. My mother's expression looks like she's wishing me luck. Meanwhile, meanwhile my father's looks more like he's warning me to keep my mouth shut and do as I'm told. My body starts to cool down once we leave the beach and enter a small path of shadows and trees. I'm not looking forward to today, and it's not like we can sneak away later today either because we won't even be, out, be allowed to leave his sight. As we all pile into the car, squishing together in the back seat while the adults take the front, Tito Manning blasts the air conditioning and drives out of the parking lot. It's not long before the, f it, the car is freezing cold, making the sweat that was once on my body feel more like ice. The temptation to ask him to turn it down is eating at me, though I've known through so many experiences before that it's best if I just stay silent and suffer through it all. Obeying the intimidation factors, just like how my father does and how Manning follows the turts. It's all just a never-ending lineup and people obeying each others because they're scared. It's sickening, really. The entire car ride back into the city is in almost complete silence. Grace is busy reading her book. Angel seems to be working on some sort of assignment for class, and June is smiling silently to himself as he stares out of the window. I know that at times they love to just sit in silence. Awkward or comforting, doesn't matter. Though I bet that today the silence is because of Manning's presence. He's very serious when it comes to the museum. He even plans and prepares an entire day of education and questions beforehand. Though, I know that's all mainly meant to point out how ignorant and stupid I am to Filipino history. 
It's not my fault that there's only a paragraph about it in my history textbooks. Besides, there's not many people who really care about their own history anyway. Very few, very few Americans even bother to research their history outside of school. And most of the people who do learn it in school will end up forgetting about it all after the test. So, Jay, Tito Manning finally speaks up. I noticed June flinch slightly at the suddenness of his voice, but he still doesn't look away from the window. Are you looking forward to actually learning about your history? I go to respond, but he continues before I can even get a word out. After all, it's not like you Americans can provide any real history about us. It's all always just propaganda. I take a moment to make sure he's actually done. We lock eyes in the rearview mirror. His eyebrows are raised and show slight amusement to my stupidity. I guess, I mumble, and his eyebrows raise just a bit higher. Before I can correct my answer to something that Manny would be pleased with, June chimes in. You know that there's propaganda in every country you go to, not just America. For instance, history classes in the Philippines also share negativity towards America. Tito Manning twitches and goes to lecture him, but June continues. I find it fascinating, really. Even though we're no longer going through world wars, we still spread propaganda worldwide to make ourselves sound better. Shut up! Manning shouts, making the entire car jump from his booming from the booming of his voice. You don't know what you're talking about. You're just a stupid boy. Once you finally know the truth about the world, then maybe you'll know to keep your mouth shut about such lies. Though I guess that makes sense, though. June continues with a cold and calm voice, acting as though his father hasn't, hadn't said a thing. All humans care about is themselves, making themselves sound better than others, dragging others down to please their own ego, even spreading suffering through the world just to make themselves look like a hero. Manning's lips curls, like a pipple getting ready to fight. What are you referring to? June finally looks away from the window, meeting his father's eyes in the rearview mirror. Neither of them relent. Our president, Manning's face turns to a boiling red rage as he continues to glare at his son. The Turk. He, br he hits the brakes. My face almost smashes into the seat in front of me, of me, but luckily June caught me. Slowly, he pulls over to the side and gets out of the car. His feet stomps on the ground as he marches over to June's side of the car and flings the door open. I can see June's heart start to race, but he manages to a straight face as he stares blankly at his pure red father. How dare you say such lies about our amazing president? He nearly screams as he j grabs June's collar and drags him out of the car. I attempt to pull June back, but I'm too slow. My cousins and their mother shout at Manning to stop as June rolls on the ground. Fresh blood slides down his lip. You ungrateful teenager! Manning grabs the back of June's shirt and lifts him back up to his feet, shouting in his face as he pulls June back to the car. You clearly know nothing about our amazing country and phenomenal leaders. June climbs back into the car, wiping the blood and dirt off his face, as Manning slams the door shut and stomps back to the driver's seat. How amazing could it be if it has people like you? June mumbles to himself as he goes back to, star to staring at the window. This time not even the faintest smile shows on his mouth. We're back to driving again. This time, the silence is neither awkward nor comforting. It's tense, suffocating even. It makes the hairs on my body stand up and the air in my lungs go still, like it's too scared to leave my body and be in the proximity of Manning. I hate that I'm like this. June was even taking my side and speaking up for me, and I didn't even have the guts to go out there and protect him. Sure, I'd definitely get my ass kicked, but at least I would have been doing the right thing. Why is it so difficult to do the right thing? It comes so easy for June. How does he do it? How does he not get scared and decide to keep his mouth shut instead? How can he be so courageous and so certain that what he's doing is for the greater good? I wish I could be more like him. I wish I could be more open about my thoughts and opinions. I wish I had the courage to call people out. June certainly isn't even near wrong either. So many people have been killed because of the turt. 
even people who have nothing to do with drugs. June has helped so many people, and he's only 17. If only people can be more like June. I'm sure that the crime weight would be so much lower if June were the president than any law that deterred him may pass. Hey, June nudges my shoulder, speaking in a whisper just quiet enough that the only two of us can hear. Don't worry about me, he smiles reassuringly. I'll be fine. Are you sure? I ask, though I'm not as good at whispering than him. Positive, he grins. And don't worry about not having my back either. I won't hold it against you. I noticed that you wanted to help. Really? I glance towards Manning as he focuses on dodging and swerving oncoming traffic, then back to June. Are you sure? Of course. He squints as his smile as his smiles as he smiles wider. We are the saints of nothing after all. And that is Patron Saints of Nothing, the short story written, the books by Randy Rebay. Next up is going to be a little story I wrote for a Tim Hortons contest called Timmy's Cold Brew. Um, and yeah, I hope you all enjoy. Enjoyed. <laughs>